that does glorious. All right, gang, we are finally here. The illustrious day where we start to get shading, start to shade, start to be able to shade for all of your assignments. Right, so whereas in the first term, right, and up until last week, I was asking you not to shade in class. Now you have to shade in class, right, or for each of your assignments from this point forward. Okay, but the reason that I've been asking you not to value anything or shade anything is because we're not going to be approaching value in a realistic way beyond a particular point. We're going to be basically approaching value in the way that it is used compositionally. It's one of the most powerful tools that you have in terms of creating visual effects, but one that um, if we are subordinating it to creating quote unquote realistic effects beyond a certain point, um, well, they tend not to make as, as much impact. So when we're dealing with value, <clears throat> we'll be talking about it in uh, three, separate ways, right? And there's multiple ways of doing each one of these things. First off is the creation of depth, right? Now there's lots of different ways of creating depth. How do you know up until this point to create depth? Give me some examples. Uh, putting things either farther in the back or closer, like depth of field. Okay, so how, so that's creating a sense of depth, right? But how would you do that? By overlapping stuff, like putting stuff in front of other stuff. Okay, so overlap, right? That's one way of convincing people that something is in front or something's further away than another thing. What's mm -hmm. another way of convincing people that things are further away than- Size. Size, right? And what would control size and scale? That we spent a good- Horizon line? seven weeks doing and what would the horizon perspective, be? perspective. Yeah. Okay, so perspective both of these things help to create a sense of depth right and you put those two things together right they create a more conspicuous sense <clears throat> conspicuous sense of depth right so size and scale are essentially controlled by perspective smaller things generally be or smaller things can be or can't be further away than bigger things, but also vice versa. We need that relationship to the horizon line in order to establish um, how big things actually are. The, one, of the, one, of an, or one of the other ways of creating a sense of depth is through value recession. And value recession isn't only, and recession isn't only specific to value. Value is just another, another type of gradient. And all gradients create a sense of recession, which means that those gradients create a sense of depth. Now, what I mean by a recession and gradients is, say with perspective, for instance, when we have lines that are receding towards a particular spot, the gradient that we're taking advantage of here is a gradient of space. How big is this space? assuming that these lines are parallel to each other versus how big is this space? How big is this space, et cetera. So if we know that those lines are running parallel to each other, but right, because of the optical illusion of perspective, right, those things appear to be getting closer and closer to each other. So hence the size or the spacing of those lines from each other tends to get further and further away. Size would be exactly the same thing. So let's say I put a person here Right? And let's just assume that all of those people are exactly the same size. As that same size person got further and further away and closer to the horizon line and vanishing point, that person would appear to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so size, scale, space, right? Those are all just different what are called perceptual categories. And those perceptual categories, as they move off into the distance, they recede, right? They get smaller. And everything has this category. Everything recedes. And that's the same for value. Now, when we're talking about value, what we're talking about is a tonal range or a, or a value range. And that range essentially exists along a gradient. And that gradient exists between two poles of black at one end of the spectrum, white at the other end of the spectrum, 
and then some hypothetically perfect 50% gray in between them. And then generally a dark gray and a light gray. And this all combined creates what you guys I'm sure have experienced in your color theory class is a five value tonal range where you've probably had to do this horrible piece of business. And unfortunately you're gonna to have to do this horrible piece of business again in this class where at one end of the spectrum, you've got you know, a perfect black, at least as close as we can create a perfect black right, given the tools at our disposal. And then at the other end of the spectrum, a perfect white Someplace in the middle, right? You've got about a 50% gray. Right? And then, you know, you've got something in between those that approximates a dark gray that links those things together. And then a light gray that links that midsection to there. Right, so this can then be expanded into a seven value system, right, or a nine value system, or an infinite array system. Whereas rather than dealing with distinct blocks of space, right, now you might be moving from, say, one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum, but along an indiscernible gradient. And regardless of which kind of gradient you're using, whether or not you're dealing with blocks of chunks of space or this smooth, this smooth surface, what we're effectively doing is moving through space at the same time. Because the way that we interpret information, and this is generally confusing for people that don't have a painting or a drawing background, especially for those of you who might have a film or photography background, the way that we interpret depth of space is that certain areas of the spectrum get associated with different layers of a drawing. So there's three typical layers of a drawing. You have a layer that exists in this end of the spectrum. You have another layer that exists at this end of the spectrum. And then you've got a layer that exists in between them. This layer is what we're gonna call your foreground from now on, and I'll just be referring to it as FG for short. This layer is your background. I'll be referring to that as BG for short. And this area here, not surprisingly, is your midground. Just referring to MG for short. Now these are gonna to help to establish right, certain areas in depth of space, but they're also gonna have structural capacities attached to them as well, where each one of these sections of the drawing will serve a particular function, generically speaking, in terms of what it does, in terms of how, or how it helps us organize space inside of, inside of a picture. <clears throat> but these values right, help to identify what's in the foreground, so what's closest to the viewer. These values right, tend to identify the setting of things, right? And more, even more specifically, say these values and these values get associated with the front and the back or the farthest and the closest areas of the picture. And then these areas get associated with that there. And they're significantly easier to distinguish when we're dealing with chunks of space rather than a smooth gradient. Foreground stuff is generally pretty easy to identify. Background stuff is pretty easy to identify. Right? But then there's this nebulous midground area when you're dealing with a smooth gradient, or it's not like you just reach this point and then all of a sudden you're in the midground, and then all of a sudden you're in the foreground. It doesn't really work that way, right? There's a seamless transition between these. So when we utilize overlapping, as a way of blocking out chunks of space in relationship to each other and then applying a particular value to them, that helps to accentuate a sense of space, right? Because the reason that things look like they're darker when they're closer to each other is 
<clears throat> because of another kind of perspective. Is it, and this isn't perspective that we've talked, talked about in terms of linear perspective or graphical projection. This is perspective that is called atmospheric perspective. And atmospheric perspective refers to physically the effect that the atmosphere has on us, sorry, on our visual and interpretive system when we look at anything right, in the world. So everything in the world has density to it, right? Me, you, right, this pad, this pencil, right, um, this, or everything, including air, right? So the atmosphere, the air that you physically breathe, the stuff that we're surrounded by 24 seven has a density to it. It just has less density than you need this pencil and this piece of paper, right? But the more of that stuff, the more of that atmosphere that gets in between you and what you're looking at creates what's called the blue haze of atmospheric perspective. So that when you look at say a tree, for example, that's really close to you, but then you look at another tree, say it's the identical kind of tree that's really far away from you. What ends up happening is that you're able to see less detail, less texture, less color, less value. Every, every perceptual category recedes. It fades off into the background, so to speak. So for instance, and this, I discovered this last term, right? So for instance, like take this tree as an example. Right? You can see all the details, all the local color. Local color just means this color that's particular to right? those particular things. Right? So all of that stuff now has a lot of deeply saturated color, dark value, right? um, detail. You can see the texture of the leaves, the bark, right? et cetera. Now let's just assume that as I flip the camera over towards looking at the North Shore, right? All of those trees on the mountain, right? Let's just assume that those are the same thing. You can't see any of that detail. They're too far away, right? And not only can you not see any of that detail because of the way that light refracts through our atmosphere, everything that gets far enough away from us increasingly takes on the blue haze, right? That light naturally accumulates as it refracts through our, our, through our atmosphere. Right? So this is something that we can't get away from. And what we're doing when we're doing stuff like this is effectively mimicking the way that we view reality and applying it to our pictures in terms of how we create a sense of depth by applying the pencil in a particular way. So that regardless of how dark or light a particular thing is, right? So if, say for instance, I take these things. <laughs> Right, both of these things right, have what's called local color to them. This has a much darker local color than this does. Right? That's, an obvious, that's an obvious statement. But both of these things, regardless of how dark those things would be, or how dark those things are comparatively to each other, would be lighter the further away that they got from you. So let's say that you took two objects right, of the different values. And let's say that these are those values, right, when they're in the foreground, right? So this is their darkness when they come up towards the front of the picture. If I wanted to draw those same objects in the background, regardless of what they are and what we recognize their local value to be, I might be drawing those objects like this one where this one is a light gray, and this one literally just takes on the white of the paper, right? So there's a recession as you move from these, those objects and then into those same objects into the background. Okay? And this is what you're trying to apply to your drawing as a way of accentuating a sense of depth or just entirely creating a sense of depth. Because let's say with classical landscape painting, for instance, a really typical way of creating a sense of depth was to put a really dark value along the bottom of the picture and then gradually lighten that value up as it starts to reach the center of the picture or the rough center of the picture. Because generally speaking, the horizon line was gonna be somewhere towards the middle of the frame in a classical landscape painting. But the exact same thing would start to happen from the top where the sky would be really dark towards the top, but then it would start to lighten up. 
as it started to move towards the center of the picture. The exact same thing would be done from the sides of the picture. Start to lighten up from the sides as it moves towards the center. Now this, weirdly enough, even though it starts to mimic what we experience with atmospheric perspective, also starts to take advantage of what we can call kind of like the expressive application of value. Easy way of explaining that is this. Standard perceptual experiment, right? In terms of perceptual experiments in psychology that have been going on for the last 50 or 60 years. You take two objects, call them buildings. Call this object A, this object or building B. And we value them in enti two entirely different ways with two different gradients. Object A, I'm gonna value like this. Object B, or building B, I'm gonna value like that. And the question in this perceptual experiment is which building's taller, A or B? So which building's taller? B. Okay, and 95% of people say that B is taller, even though optic or in actual fact, right, those, those buildings in that experiment are exactly the same size. So this is taking advantage of an optical illusion where because this thing lightens up as it gets closer towards the top, it feels like it's reaching up and disappearing into the sky, right? But it's also firmly rooted into the ground because of this heavy weight of value at the bottom. Whereas this feels like it's being pushed down by that weight into the ground, right? And as a result, there's a compressive aspect to it. So this type of value has a feeling or an expressive value of elevation. This type of valuing has an, exp or an expressive value of compression. So what this means is that this type of value pushes the picture up, but then this also pushes the picture down pushes the picture in, pushes the picture in. But what it's doing simultaneously is because of this atmospheric perspective thing is also pushing the picture back in space. And it's doing it from every direction. Right, because we naturally associate things that are lighter with things that are further away from us, right? And same arrows go over here in terms of funneling information away from us. So this thing's not only moving up, down, sideways towards the center of the picture, but it's also moving in, in space, right? Moving away from you or towards you, right? Depending on the value that's associated with it. <clears throat> now we can make that, we can make that sense of space more obvious because if I use overlap and divide the frame up into its three <clears throat> generic sections, foreground, midground, background. If I just put a chunk of space here and call that my foreground and then accentuate that by overlapping that chunk of space in front of another chunk of space and call that my midground and then put another chunk of space in here and call that my background, I already have a sense of depth simply by overlapping those chunks of space. And when I associate a certain value to it, say a really dark value to this versus a lighter value to this versus an even lighter value with this and an even lighter value back there and so on and so forth. Right Now I have overlap and atmospheric perspective right, creating a sense of depth. So it's a very powerful tool in terms of creating a sense of depth in order to maintain the spatial relationships of your picture. And those spatial relationships, again, are gonna be important not only to create kind of like a realistic picture, so to speak, right? but also because each one of these areas, again, is gonna have a structural function associated, associated with it. Right? And we're gonna get into this more next class. Your foreground is gonna serve the purpose of being what's called a foreground entrance. Right, and we'll talk more about what that means next class. Your background serves the function of literally just being the setting. Right, so where do things happen? 
And so this is telling you where things are happening. Your foreground entrance is exactly what it sounds like. It's the visual entrance for where an audience starts reading your picture, looking at your picture. And then generally speaking, it's funneling your eye towards a midground, which generally speaking is going to be the home of your focal point. Not always, there's lots of exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, that's where your focal point is going to be. So for instance, like a good example of that would be, say, if I move in behind this camera, right? This thing is your foreground entrance, right? It's the closest thing to the camera or closest thing to you guys. I'm your focal point, obviously, right? And all the shit in behind me is your background, right? So I've got a structural function for each one of these particular areas. And as I allocate different values to them, it helps to identify where all of those structural things are going to be taking place. Okay, so this is gonna be part of your job with your assignment is to use this five value scale and associate this stuff here with those areas of your drawing there. Right, so you're going to be required to draw this five value spectrum on top of your picture. Put those values in, right, and then you're going to apply those values in flat graphic chunks to the individual spaces that you're developing in your picture, regardless of what those things are. And this is why I wanted you to watch the uh, spider verse noir, right, um, example, right, because that's an excellent example of applying this and still creating a realistic sense of depth with that amongst doing other things. So then you're going to take these values and then associate it with your background area. And then you're going to take these values here and associate them with your midground area. And it's not an exact science, like this doesn't have to be perfect, but you are going to have to value all of your pictures um, in or, or sorry, from this point forward. So this is a good time to get used to it. And especially important, it's going to be to access the ends of the spectrum, right? The black ends of the spectrum versus the white ends of the spectrum. Because most early drawings start to hover around this area for a variety of reasons, two main reasons. One is because people are terrified of going too dark with their drawing. Whether or not it just be with line value or with, that, or with chunks of space, and reason being is that if you go too dark, right, that black, right, or that really dark value ends up being really difficult to erase. So if you need to get rid of it, right, because you've screwed your drawing up, it's almost impossible to get rid of it and then the whole drawing's fucked up, right? So people generally stay away from it. This is really difficult to maintain because typically, or typically speaking, you're drawing with pencil and you're rubbing your hand all over the page, right? And you're smudging the shit out of it. So you lose all the white areas, right? And as a result, what you get is drawings that tend to congregate around this area of the spectrum. And what ends up happening when you do that is that you get a compression of space. Right? You start to lose the different ends of this value range. And as a result, that space gets narrower or shallower rather. So the wider the tonal range that you've got, the deeper the space that you have, right? but the shallower the tonal range, the shallower the space that you have. And that sense of compression is going to affect the other aspects of um, how we're using depth as well. There's this fly that I'm having an ongoing battle with here. Haha! -ha! Guess who won that one? That's right, me. Yes. Okay. Um, any questions? I just I, have... I just murdered something on camera and no reaction. I have a question. Okay. Um. I'm going to use like one point as an example because it's easier to wrap my brain around. But say you have like a one point road going on to like infinity. Um, does So is the front of the road going to be really dark and then the end of the road going to be like white? Exactly. Okay, right? cool. So let's say, that, let's say that this is your road here. Basically, like if I was doing with a, a smooth gradient, that road would gradually do this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I got it now. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Uh, Jay. Yep. 
the quality uh, of this stream is not as crisp as before. Like it's a little bit blurry and it just keeps like flickering. Oh, hold on a second. Let me, uh, it might be a. Hey, there's two of you. <laughs> How'd you like my up close dental shot? <laughs> that was fun. I was like, Your teeth are awful, dude. I have that screen pinned. So it's like the biggest. So it wasn't just like your mouth. It was like you're eating my entire screen. <laughs> that looks a little better, yeah? Yeah. Um, actually, give it a few seconds. Hold on. I might be on a different... Um, I didn't check. I didn't double check the network that I was on. Here. Give me a second. Maybe that has something to do with it. No, I'm on the right network. Is that any better? Mm, I, it's the same for me. I don't know. Is anybody else having this problem or is it just me? I I think it's, I found it's been like this, like every meeting. So I think it's. Let's try I something. just find the words sort of hard to discern, but everything I else is fine. I can't read any of the words. Yeah, me neither. I actually went through like all the pictures that we took from the last uh, classes on Twitter, like super clear. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right? Oh, that's, that's I'm looking at the wrong thing. So much better. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a lot there better. Go, Let's just do it this way then. Doesn't matter to me which one does what, so. Let's get rid of this. Bam. Yeah, I'd say that's an improvement. I don't know why that, I mean, it was working fine up until then. Like the other classes have been fine, haven't they? Oh yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I mean, hopefully you were able to make sense of what it is that I was talking about, right? But now at least you've got um, that in fucking surround sound, so to speak. Hi HD, um, but um, this would probably be a very important screen to screenshot now, seeing as how everything that I was talking about is now in crystal clear, or is now crystal clear. Um, but that being said, does anybody need any clarification about what it is that I've gone over in terms of the creation of depth through value? Hopefully the explanation is enough to make it succinct. I didn't exactly get what you meant by layers. Layers? Yeah. Okay, so does this make sense what I did here? Yeah, that makes that does make sense. Okay, so this is what I mean by layers. That's a foreground layer, that's a midground layer, that's a background layer. Okay. And each one of those layers have a different end of the value spectrum associated with them. Right, so dark gray, black, mid gray, light gray, dark gray, light gray, white for the creation of depth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, what happens when you mix it up? Because like in this, the one that you drew is like pretty easy, but like if you, it's a little bit more complicated. What do you mean? Like sometimes you put things in the picture that you cannot decide exactly like which layer it can be in. Okay, so this is an important an important distinction, right? As opposed to like drawing things realistically where they actually are in space and what their value is, mm -hmm. as opposed to drawing things to maintain their place inside of a, in, inside of a certain picture. Okay, so for instance, I can go in, right? And just arbitrarily decide inside this space, for instance, that, okay, well, I'm gonna have a chunk of space here. And then along that chunk of space, you know, I'm going to have some chunks of grass. 
right? Some rocks, right, et cetera. And that all of those things are gonna be at least this dark. Right, so you see how they start to maintain that space. And I can make those things even darker, right, to establish like a little bit of depth inside that picture. Right, so say I wanna like imply that light's coming from a particular direction. And so I can make things a little bit darker, but everything's sticking inside that area of the spectrum. You know, I'm gonna do this and I can do the exact same thing over here. It's like, you know, maybe I've got, you know, a different kind of twig, tree, right? Whatever the case may be. So that becomes my foreground stuff there, right? And I can have sky, right? That does exactly the same thing, right? So I'm limiting the values that are associated with those particular areas simply because I want them to be associated with those particular areas. Mm -hmm. So does, does that part make sense? Yeah. Okay, well then let's just say that I arbitrarily establish another chunk of space here, right? But now I want that chunk of space to now be associated with say a more mid-groundy type of space. So now I'm putting say the same trees, bushes, rocks, Right, etc. inside that space. But now I'm reducing their value so that they appear a little bit further away. So I'm limiting the values that I'm associating with them to that there. And then as I get a little bit further away again, now, you know, that same stuff is even lighter. And so on and so forth, right? Now I can put in like a mountain range off in the background that's even lighter. So I changed nothing about that, you know, generic gradient that I've created. And now all of the objects that are just basically superimposed over top of that gradient are just forced to adopt the values that are associated with it. Okay, that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you're right. Like when it's really simple like this, this is, you know, pretty easy to, to grapple with. But if we change that, actually, let's, rather than doing that, ignore that. Let's just say that I do something like this, where I'm drawing like chunks of grass. And then in front of that chunk of grass, I draw another chunk of grass. And, you know, maybe I overlap some of that mm -hmm. stuff. And then, but then I also associate a certain value with that. That's grass in the background, that's grass in the midground. And then when I come up to say my foreground chunk of stuff, I'm doing the exact same thing, overlapping things, right? But now I'm drawing stuff in this value. So you're essentially in a weird way, you're drawing realistically by ignoring what you're seeing in reality, because you're forcing everything into this value because you want it associated with this level of the drawing, regardless of what its local color or actual color might be. So for instance, if you were to draw me with a black t-shirt in the foreground, even though I don't know what the fuck they're building across the street, but it sure is enjoyable to listen to while I'm teaching. Even though this is a lot darker than my skin tone, my skin tone would arbitrarily be darkened so that I could be associated more readily with the foreground. So how is that? That's probably like over clarification at this point. <laughs> it's really good. Thanks. Okay. So you're going to have to do, each one of you is going to have to do this in your assignment is to use this five value system that you're going to put on top of your drawing as a way of creating a sense of depth. Okay. And that's going to be background noise for the rest of the term. All of your drawings are going to have to do this. 
Um, uh, I have a question that might be sort of weird. So if you're like drawing like a picture where the sun is coming, sun or there's like a light source coming up from behind you, that would yeah. make like the objects in the foreground lighter and like the objects in the background so much darker because it's further from a light source, right? Yeah. So how would so that work can, out? So you can, re you can reverse the gradient as a way of creating the same effect, right? So for like nighttime scenes, right? Or reverse lighting scenes, you can do exactly that where that gradient can now move like this. Right? And because the context is going to be such that the light source is now moving in that direction, right? you would achieve the exact same effect. Right? Because the stuff that's further away from the sun is going to get darker and darker. So as you move from top to bottom, bottom to top, right? and then from towards the center of the picture, right? we get a reverse gradient. But for purposes of this assignment, that's what we're looking for. OK, sure. OK, so that's a better, that's a better page to screenshot now, just because there's more shit. Okay, thing number two that you're going to have to do for your assignment. Is that you have to create, using value, a sense of focus. Right, so you've got to create a focal point. Now, again, we've got multiple ways of doing this. Tell me how we can create focus. What are the ways, what are the tools that you've got to create focus so far? Uh, putting it in the like center of the field of view or the center of the horizon line. And so central, central position, right? Central position in, with respect to the frame. Uniqueness. Unique, right? So we can make that thing unique. What else? Well, what about the horizon line? What, what specifically about the horizon line creates focus? Like you want to put it on the horizon line. So you're looking directly at it, so to speak. Okay, but anywhere on the horizon line or where? The middle. Right, and what's in the, the middle of the point. horizon line? Vanishing point. Vanishing point. So it's not just the horizon line. Specifically, it's the one point vanishing point that creates focus. Now, what else creates focus? Uh, empty space around the subject. OK, so empty space. Isolation. So, exactly. Breathing space, because that breathing space allows you to isolate an object. So you're going to have to do all of these things. Because what we're going to do in this particular assignment is use all the tools available to us as a way of really accentuating a sense of focus, amplifying that focus. And we're, the most powerful tool that you've got as a way of creating focus is contrast. And what I mean by contrast right, is that on this spectrum of black versus white, again, there's a tonal range. The tonal range of that spectrum is at its highest between black and white. That contra or when we contrast values in relationship to each other, what that means is that we're putting those things up against each other. And the highest degree of contrast that we have is black versus white. <coughs> right, so when we put this, <coughs> Demon be gone. Next to that, that's a really high level of contrast. Low contrast is examples of it would be say light gray and white, light gray and mid gray, dark gray and mid gray, and dark gray and black. 
So basically, you can have low contrast at any point of the spectrum. And any contrast, say like dark gray versus light gray, for instance, that's higher contrast than dark gray versus gray, but it's lower contrast than black versus white. So this stuff here, this is reserved for your focal point. Is that you're arbitrarily valuing things so that your focal point is either a white object up against a black ground or a black object up against a white ground. And that's the, again, the usefulness of that empty space is that you can arbitrarily make that space as if it's like a spotlight of a character on stage. Right? The reason that they spotlight characters on stage is because it creates that really high degree of contrast around that thing that they want you to pay attention to. And it's a really easy way of doing it right? because there's nothing else to pay attention to with, their, or with respect to that. But what they're taking advantage of here is something that we effectively can't get. We can't do anything about in terms of the way that we perceptually act or react to this because it's so deep seated in terms of an evolutionary and physiological makeup of us. So I'm gonna bore you with a little bit of biology in order to really make this point because what we're taking advantage of when we do this, right, is something that makes us react on a very primitive level and is very effective as a result of that because even though you don't know, you might not know what it is you're reacting to, you can't help but react this way. Okay, so basically in your eye, Right, you have what are called receptor cones, the receptor cells, and you have two different kinds of receptor cells. You have rods and cones. Right, the rods, right, are the ones, or the rods are the ones that are going to be, the are going to be the ones that we are talking about, that are responsible for this. Your cones are are the stuff that you use to focus on things. So when we create a sense of focus in a picture, or when we focus on anything. The sense of thing or the way that we create, when we create a sense of focus in a picture, we're mimicking what it looks like when we physically focus on something. So when I say focus on this pencil, I have to look at that thing, literally bring it into focus in order to concentrate on it to pick it up. But when I focus on it, because of the way that your receptor cells are geared, certain things become evident. First off, your cones are, cell, are color sensitive. And right? we'll get more into this when we talk about um, color towards the end of the term, right? So your, your cones are the ones that are doing all of, the, or all of the color reception in your field of vision. But what they're also really good at is picking up detail. And we're phenomenally good at picking up detail. And we're phenomenally good at doing this because all of your cones, right? And you have about, let's call it about 5 million of these things at a place at the back of your retina called your phobia. Each one of these 5 million to 7 million cones, depending on who you're talking about, has what's called a retinal ganglion cell attached to it. This thing, you can think about it as being basically a fiber optic cable that attaches to the back of your eye and then funnels information back into your brain. Okay? And each one of those cones has a dedicated cable, a dedicated fiber as part of that cable that funnels information back to your brain. So you have 5 to 7 million of these cables funneling independent information back to your brain which means that we're phenomenally good at recognizing detail, which is why we're so detail oriented, which is why that when we create something that has focus, high detail, right, et cetera, attached to it inside of a picture, we naturally attribute the same sort of level of importance to it that we do when we focus on a thing enough to physically pick it up or do anything with it. Right, so that's what we're trying to do with a focal point. Now, how contrast plays into this has nothing to do with your rod or with your cones. It has everything to do with your rods. Now, your rods, first off, are colorblind, right? They don't perceive color at all. And rather than being at the center of the phobia where all the cones are, your rods exist right, in a higher percentage as you get out towards the peripheral versions of vision or areas of your vision. So when you're out here, kind of like wiggling your fingers, right, towards the peripheral edges of your vision, you can't actually see color out here. The color that you think you see is color that you know, right? And your brain's kind of filling in the gap of what color my fingers are, or what color an apple is, or whatever the case may be. But what your rods are really good at doing is aggregating information because your rods don't have a dedicated cable 
back to your brain. Your rods have, they share cables. So you might have hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of rods sharing a single fiber of that, or a single fiber of that fiber optic cable. So when you have hundreds of thousands of rods responding to the same thing, basically what you get is a huge pulse of information that triggers your brain to react to that pulse. And what your rods are really good at recognizing is changes in value, right? Because all they do is see in black and white, right? And changes in movement. Okay? And generally speaking, right, at a really basic level, movement and value changes are almost are almost identical. So take like an you guys ever remember the old video game Pong? Yeah. Right, where it's just a fucking dot, a pixel floating across the screen. Well, all that thing is, is a pixel that starts here, disappears, and then starts here, right? And then disappears, and then reappears here, and then disappears and reappears here. And what your brain does is it naturally assumes that that's the same thing moving along a trajectory. So it's taking that high contrast dot and then as as associating movement to that dot. Right? And your eyes right, are interpreting the visual world and funneling that information right, back to your brain in a very similar way right, when we view anything. Now, what on earth is the fucking point of me telling you all of this stuff? The evolutionary explanation why we have these two different um, aspects of our visual system is essentially one of survival. We focus on things right with our cones. They're color sensitive, right? Because it allows us to identify shit that we get to put in our face and eat to survive. Red berries, green bush, right? Shit that I can right? essentially ingest. This is a defense mechanism, right? I don't need to focus on something that's rustling in the bushes off to my right in order to know to get the fuck out of Dodge because there's a Bengal tiger lurking in the jungle, right? Or a bear or whatever. I can just get the fuck out of Dodge, right? Because my visual system is cueing cueing my brain on a really primitive level that this thing over here is important. You get that flight or flight syndrome, right? Or a reaction, right? And then immediately, right? You identify that thing as being important. So when we do both of those things, right? make something obvious because of its isolation and all of these other things that it's important for us to focus on. We're mimicking things that we want to focus on. But when we do this, you're cueing your brain at a very deep seated and primitive level that this thing is essentially a threat right, to your existence. Right now, obviously, your pictures that you're creating aren't a threat to your existence, but the important part of this little parable that I'm developing is that is that's essentially what you're cueing your audience to feel when you introduce a high contrast situation into a picture. So your focal point isn't only a focal point in terms of the thing, the subject matter that you're paying attention to. It's also a focal point emotionally, right? Where you feel like it's important. And that's the key point. So that when we develop focus, because there's all these different ways of developing focus, this always wins. Whatever you put in high contrast is automatically going to be interpreted by your brain as going to be a, as being a focal point, which means that all of this stuff is just as important because everything else in your environment has to be in lower contrast. It doesn't have to be in this really low contrast. It just has to be lower than this. Or if your highest degree of contrast in your picture is dark gray versus light gray, then everything else has to be a lower degree of contrast. And you might wanna create low contrast pictures because of the emotion that you wanna to attach to things. Right? Because your brain is basically a, a goldfish. It's just swimming around looking for bright shiny shit to pay attention to, right? And it's our job to con basically control what it pays attention to. So if I put a single black object over here in the frame, that's easy. My brain knows that that thing's important and I should pay attention to it, but there's nothing else to pay attention to. As soon as I put this other thing over here, now my brain's confused, right? Because now I wanna pay attention to both of those things, right? But what it also does in this instance is it starts to develop a story between those things. Oh, there's two things to pay attention to. 
because there's only two things to pay attention to. Now there must be a relationship between those things. So now rather than identifying one thing is important, now I've got two things that, that are important, but now they share a story between each other. When I put a third thing, now I've diluted the presence of all of those things. And then so on and so forth. I, I can put a fourth thing here, right? I can put a fifth thing here. Right? And you know, I can keep clustering that picture until there's so many things that they all basically cancel each other out. Now, are there, this is a way of developing multiple points of focus inside of a picture, which we'll get into in another, in a couple of classes. Your job is to identify a single point of focus by putting an object that's in the center of the frame in really high contrast, but then reducing the level of contrast of all of the other things that might be in black, but their surrounding context is such that you're reducing the tonal range of those objects and their surrounding environment so that even though those things are the same value as that thing, they don't have the same contrast as that thing. And as a result, these things are less important, this thing's more important, right? And it doesn't matter whether or not it's dots, puppies, fish, hamburger, whatever. Okay. This is why we're arbitrarily associating certain areas of the picture, right? With certain kind of values, right? And also certain areas of the picture arbitrarily keeping conspicuously empty, right? So that I can associate a certain value to it. And so that I don't have to redraw it. Let's just go back to the previous example. Let's say that this is now my focal area here. Well, I can arbitrarily introduce the lonely wanderer coming up over the hills or coming up over the hillside in really high contrast. He's got lots of empty space around him. Right? There's nothing distracting her from the environment right? coming in front of her behind. They're in really high contrast. So now as a result, regardless of how small that thing is, it becomes immediately apparent what the focal point of that picture is. Because I've got that thing in the center of the frame, I've got that thing isolated, I've got it in really high contrast. And as a result, that thing immediately becomes a thing that's more important than anything else. And if I wanted to accentuate that, say I could reduce the contrast level, again, arbitrarily of that area right there, so that becomes even more apparent. Does that make sense in terms of creating a sense of focus using contrast? Yeah. Okay, so it's not only important to have that focal point being in high contrast, it's also gonna be important that for the rest of your environment, you reduce the level of contrast. If you want to see good examples of this, watch anything by Pixar and Disney, right? That's animated. Right? The only area of a Disney film, right? Especially the old ones that is going to be black versus white is a character's eyes. Right? It's a very effective way for them to take the white of the iris and the black of the pupil and have you emotionally identify with that character as a result. You might have areas of black and areas of white inside the same frame, but they're not gonna be black and white up against each other. This draws you into a character in the most, right, essentially primitive and easy to identify way possible. And as a result is the most effective way for you to identify with a character who's surprised or mad, or I don't know, just fucking clued out right, or sad, right, or whatever as a result of that high contrast. But in order for that to make impact, right, they've got to have to reduce the level of contrast throughout the rest of their picture. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to do all of these things inside of your drawing. Your object, your focal point is gonna be in front of a one point vanishing point. It's gonna be in the center of the frame. It's gonna be unique. It's gonna be isolated in front of that breathing space. But most importantly, it's gonna have high contrast of black versus white. And again, I don't care whether it's black versus a white ground or white versus a black ground, right? but that's gonna be conspicuously present in the center of the frame. 
So you're going to have to do creation of depth, creation of focus using value. Any questions about how to do either one of those things? Okay, well, that's a decent page to screenshot then. We can and put our subject anywhere though, right? No, your subject has to go in the middle of the frame. No, no, no. I mean like uh, on the layers. So it can be on the background, it can be on the mid-ground or in the foreground. Yeah, I mean, typically, I mean, next class, what I'm going to ask you to do is create a focal point in the mid-ground um, right, because of what we're going to be concentrating on next week. So if you want to kind of get a jump start on that, right, you can play with that. Um, but for purposes of this assignment, yeah, you can basically put your focal point anywhere you want, okay. as long as it has this level of contrast and shares all of these other characteristics. I have a question yeah. for the uh, focal point. Say it's in the background. Can you still make it like super dark, even though it's in the background? Absolutely. Okay. So there is a, and it's good that you raised the question because there is a direct contradiction between doing that and what it is that I've said in terms of maintaining space, depth of, or depth of placement inside of a picture. And there's no real good answer that I have for this other than a conjecture that because your focal point is generally a relatively small area of your picture and is generally, again, a uniquely, a uniquely valued element of your picture, we generally tend to associate it with, right, and don't have a problem with associating it, don't have a problem associating it with that mid-ground or background or other area of the picture, even though technically it does come forward. But because it's so conspicuous in terms of its high contrast, it almost comes forward in a way that reflects the emotional importance of it or the perceptual importance of it in the sense that it appears to jump forward to us, if that makes sense. It gets associated with importance as opposed to associated with a sense of space, another way of explaining it. Yeah, that makes sense. But you're not wrong, like it should be you know, that should be up here as opposed to back there. But although I guess that doesn't, should be up here as opposed to back there. You know, retrain my brain to deal with the camera. Okay, any other questions before we move on to the last thing? Okay, the last thing is using value. And this might be the most important thing is using value to create a sense of emotion. This arguably is the most important thing, but ironically is the most difficult thing to, at least from this side of the camera, teach because there's no second decimal point way of applying emotion to this. Depth and focus is relatively easy because there's something at least quasi-scientific, if not actual hard science that we can fall back on and say, no, nope, this seems to function this way because of what we know about biology and the brain, right? We know a lot about the eye, for instance. We know like an enormous amount about how the eye physically works and how it interprets information. And as a result, we know basically how it interprets senses of depth, right? Senses of focus, right? How it reacts, right? To color, to value, right? Et cetera, to movement. We also know a lot about the way that light right, refracts through the atmosphere and how packets of radiation right, are turned into visual impulses right through a complex biochemical and electrical process. What we know about emotion is intuitively true and intuitively hard fact as well, right? In the sense that we know that changes of lighting create different kinds of emotional states, right? And, you know, you only have to, well, let's just sit through like a painfully obvious example of, of um, my own. Let's say, take like a really stereotypical um, scenario. Let's say, take, take a romantic dinner, for example. What kind of lighting would you associate with a romantic dinner? Like candlelit. Candlelit, right, or something that created the same sort of effect. In front of a fireplace, Maybe you don't have candles or a fireplace, but maybe you got dimmer switches, right? It's like, anyway, something that's soft, low, sets the mood, so to speak, 
Now you can take the exact same information, same place, same people, same food, same wine, right? Same love is in the air, same music, all of that jazz. But change the lighting situation so that now the participants in that meal are holding a flashlight underneath their face, right? Totally different vibe, right? Probably not creating the same mood, depending on what you're into, I suppose, right? But it doesn't take a lot of effort, right, to imagine that, no, that's an entirely different type of situation now, even though the subject matter is exactly the same, right? So as an even like worse example, let's just say that, you know, I continue teaching this class, right? But now I teach it like that, where there is no me, right? It's just, it's just dark. It, it would be fucking weird for me to teach the class like that, right? Because there's no, there's no opportunity for you to engage, right? With not only me, right? But any sort of lighting situation. You take me, right? And change the lighting situation so that I'm overexposed, underexposed, et cetera. Everything changes. So we know that it works. Right? But the problem is that we don't necessarily know why it works. Because as soon as you get past the eye and into the brain, shit gets really fuzzy in terms of what we know. Right? There's, it's more of kind of like guidelines that we've got and indications that something is going on when things are ultimately interpreted in the visual cortex. Right? But how it's interpreted and why it's interpreted that particular way, uh, it's ongoing, shall we say, in terms of the field of study. So what we've got in terms of creating emotion, right, are guidelines. And those guidelines are roughly broken up into two general categories. Okay. Changes in lighting that create or alter a sense of mood okay, and changes of lighting that alter a sense of drama, right? And with mood, this is essentially the realm of brightness. How light or how dark is a picture? Right? And, you know, as an almost irresponsibly brief way of explaining this, dark values equal dark moods. And not surprisingly, light values equal light moods. And the general heuristic right between or for this is that dark moods fall into three categories, sad, mad, and scared. Light moods fall into one category. So we kind of get screwed on the emotional spectrum, glad. So sad, mad, glad, and scared, right? You've got one happy emotion, three scared emotions, right? All the dark stuff exists here, all the light stuff exists here. Right now, this is again, a generalization. It's very easy to imagine happy stuff that happens in dark places. It's very easy to imagine, right? Sad stuff or mad stuff or angry stuff, right? Or scared stuff that happens in bright places, right? So say for instance, an explosion, right? That tears people apart. That's a scary, right? Or that's a scary situation. Right? Now I can make that artificially dark though, as a way of making it feel more like the mood that I'm trying to capture. Birthday party, right? Happy, right? Generally speaking, right? But I can e I could easily make that dark, right? Turn off all the lights, high contrast situation, right? So that I can blow out candles, type of thing, right? And it still feels happy. But I can brighten that environment up so that when I actually present that to people, the picture feels happy. Right, as opposed to feeling darker and heavy. Okay, so these are general guidelines that you can just kind of like pull out of the pocket and use whenever it is that you need to in order to make it easier for your audience to interpret pictures. Okay, so that means that if you're creating a picture that's overall light, your, values, your value range might be a lot lighter. So your foreground information might start, say, at, gray, or maybe at the most dark gray. And then your midground might be light gray, and then your background and even lighter gray or white for a picture that you want to feel like that. So there's still a sense of regression, but you started at a lighter point so that you still get that sense 
of, or so you get that emotional state. Whereas if I took the exact same picture, right, but now value it in an entirely different way. That has a darker, heavier, somber, more somber feeling to it. And so again, there's an expressive aspect to value. And this is one of the reasons why I don't, I didn't want you to value realistically, right? Or it's just start valuing, start valuing any way at all, including realistically, because this is what we're after, right? We're after a sense of depth. Yes, that's realistic. We're after accentuating a sense of focus. Yes, that kind of mimics reality, but we're arbitrarily contrasting things in order to accentuate that sense of focus. But we're also arbitrarily valuing things as a way of creating a sense of mood inside of a picture. Right? So that regardless of what it is that you're drawing, right, and what its local color might be, its actual color or value might be, we're valuing it in one way or another in order to create that mood. Okay, so this is one aspect of what you have to do for your emotional side. Basically just decide, is the mood that you're dealing with a dark one or a light one, and then associate the overall level of brightness to your picture. Next is like, I'm gonna ask you for your assignment to create a dramatic picture. So you're not gonna have an option here. But drama is the arena of contrast. And basically high drama, equals high contrast. Low drama equals low contrast. So this is why your focal point takes on such an emotionally charged aspect is that when you put this and this together for your focal point, that's automatically a high contrast situation. Your environment by being low contrast as a result of having that lower level of contrast attached to it is a less exciting place emotionally and structurally visually okay so we're going to include a higher degree of contrast inside your picture your focal point is going to be the only thing inside the picture that has black versus white in it but the other areas of the picture i want you to concentrate or contrast gray versus white, dark gray versus light gray, right? Or gray versus black, right? As a way of creating a slightly higher contrast picture for the other elements of your picture, right? So the only area that's gonna get black versus white is your focal point. All of the other areas are controls that they have um, lower degrees of contrast. And what I want you to do for your assignment is essentially identify the blocks of space that you're gonna be dealing with, effectively just in silhouette form, right? And then fill those spaces up, right? With flat graphic blocks of those five different color or those five different values, right? So the five values that you're gonna be using again are gonna be on top of your picture, right? And you're gonna have black, dark gray, gray, light gray and white that you're then associating to all of the objects inside of your picture. Okay, so what I want you to do for your assignment, you're just gonna do one drawing, but I want that drawing to have certain characteristics to it. First off, it's got a focal point that's in the center in front of the one point vanishing point in its own breathing space so that it's isolated and is black versus white in terms of, so that it has the highest degree of contrast possible. It also has to have a realistic sense of depth. So moving from the darkest values towards the lightest values as you go from front to back in the picture. It also has to be a dramatic picture. 
So I've already described how I want you to associate value to that. But what I also want you to do right, is because we're incorporating your one point into this, the whole picture is going to be drawn in one point just to make it easy. Right? But in order to make a more dramatic picture, I want you to Dutch the whole thing. Okay, so you're using a really simple perspective, right? But then high contrast situations and a really simple tool of cropping or tilting the camera in order to accentuate the drama of a picture. So in terms of like a previous student example, that would be the best way for me to show this. That's a really good, that's a really good example. Doesn't matter what your focal point is to me, I don't care, right? But when I look at your picture, it should be immediately obvious what that picture or what that object is or what that focal point is. Right? And then everything else inside the picture has had its level of contrast reduced, right? But that there's also a sense of recession, right? With that or with those objects as well as they go off into space, right? So is that, no, it doesn't do that. Oh, it does do that. Okay, so I want this value spectrum here set up on the side of your page or on front of your page. Let's see. All right, and then tilt this into landscape, obviously, right? But then again, right, it's a different version of the same thing. High contrast focal point, everything's dutched. Right? With gradual recession from dark stuff to light stuff. The only thing that could be improved in this assignment that be, you could have a gradient going from the front through this mid area here towards the focal point, or you could arbitrarily set up chunks of space into recessive blocks that recede as well. So that's another decent example. Why is this here? Because I put this in the entirely wrong folder, that's why. Okay, so as another example, oops. This is all the nuts and bolts of stuff that we've done today with a little bit of additional information. Okay, so that's a really good example of why Spider-Man Noir right, is good, right? So there's your highest area of contrast, right? Now for purposes of your assignment, you would reduce this contrast a little bit and reduce this contrast a little bit. This still works, but for reasons that we're gonna go over in um, a couple of classes, right? Where this is creating multiple points of focus along what's called a visual pathway in a rough pyramidal triangle or a pyramidal visual pattern. So for your pur for purposes of your assignment, you would reduce these other levels of contrast and just maintain this as your focal point. Really good student example. Right? Again, everything in one point, everything's Dutch, there's your focal point, right? In arbitrarily high contrast. Okay, so hopefully that makes that makes sense. This is a good example right, as well. So there's a wide variety of applications, right, that you can use this for. Uh, the way that student has the uh, scale at the top of the photo, is that how you want us to submit it? Uh, the other one. This one, yes, exactly. So please like that. And have those values more closely correspond with the values that you're actually using. Now, how you do this is entirely fine. You can hand draw this, 
if you want, but if you want to draw this digitally and fill it in in Photoshop, that's entirely fine too. But if you're doing this digitally, I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to use prefabricated shapes, right? This is still hand-drawn. So that includes ruler tools, right? Or prefabricated circles or squares or anything like that. Gradient tools, you're still drawing this. It, this is still a drawing class, right? This isn't a, how well can I manipulate this program class? If you're drawing, drawing it on paper, can you use like Sharpie or stuff to make the black black? Um, I would prefer you stick with a single medium. And so as a result of that, please don't use Sharpie because it's going to be very difficult for you to create anything other than a black with a Sharpie. So um, tools that I would suggest using are these Prismacolor pencils, right? A dark value of that, blue, purple, um, black, green, right? Or pencils. You shouldn't have to go anywhere beyond HB to maybe two or three B with the grade of paper that you're using. That's probably the easiest to use. Charcoal and compressed charcoal, willow charcoal, all of that stuff. It's just gonna to be too messy. Save yourself the frustration right? and uh, save those things for other, for other um, situations. Um, so no, you can't use Sharpie in case that wasn't clear. Okay, so this is your assignment. This is a good page to screenshot as well for your emotional stuff. Now there's other stuff that I do wanna talk about with respect to emotion, but I think that we can talk about that later on, right? Um, as we go forward. Do you guys have any questions about what your assignment is or what we've gone over today before um, we take a look at uh, your examples? Because I do wanna talk about the examples a little bit in a little bit more depth because I do think they are important to unpack for stuff that we're gonna do in um, subsequent classes. Okay, well, that's a long time for you guys to sit and listen to me uh, ramble. So why don't we just take a quick five minutes and reset, go to the bathroom, grab a glass, grab a glass of water or something like that. Um, and at 10.30, uh, we will start looking at the examples and we'll try to get through that in about 15 minutes so that, uh, you know, you've got time left over. Okay. Sound good? Uh, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. See you at 10.30. Why again? What's that? Huh? said I'm filled with hate for whatever's happening across the street from my place. Uh, okay, let's take a look at um, the things I wanted you to look at, right? Especially the, um, well, not especially, but both of them. Okay, um, two radically different, or three radically different clips that I wanted you to watch. Um, this one, best foreign film, um, I don't know, however many years ago it came out. And regardless of your familiarity with the Christian story, which does help a little bit in terms of interpreting this, is a very useful clip for us to look at right and movie to watch in general because of it's all black and white right which means it's controlling all value in order to create certain effects but it's very good in terms of showing stuff communicating the overall mood and message that's trying to be delivered entirely cinematically right? as opposed to using words right and dialogue action right in order to do, to do things so for instance a good way to start interpreting images is to just take a look at what is actually presenting itself in the image. So um, I'm going to assume, hopefully safely, that you guys have all seen this clip. Have you? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So who are these people? Right. Not specifically, but generically. Where are they? And what are they doing? And I don't mean where geographically. I mean, like, what kind of context are they in? And what are they doing in that context? So who, who are these people? What is their job, so to speak, their profession, their purpose, their function? They're like sculptors. They are not. I think. Yeah. Sorry, what? Yeah. 
they might also be sculptors, but first and foremost, they are what? Uh, like nuns, priests related. Like stuff. nuns, exactly. Right. So they're actually nuns, right? It doesn't matter whether or not they're nuns or right, or some other spiritual belief, right? What matters is that these character, these people ha are people that are devoted to a higher being, some supernatural, otherworldly entity, spiritual entity. What are these nuns doing throughout this sequence? What are these people doing? So for instance, what's the nun doing here? And here, what's she doing? What does it look like she's doing? She painting something. She's painting something. Right? She's painting. She's painting a, a, a statue of the Christ. What's this nun doing, or what does it look like she's doing? I think it, it feels like she's fixing the scaffolding and like the walls and stuff. She's fixing the wall. What's this nun doing off in the background here? Cleaning. 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 All right. So these characters are doing stuff that takes care of this house, that takes care of this place. Where do nuns live? Where do these characters live? Where are they? A church. A church, right? A convent. So what's important about this is that you have characters, right, that are devoted to a higher, you know, spiritual being. They're engaged in acts of service, worship, right, towards that, uh, that higher spiritual being, right, and they are, are living in that place, right, that is devoted to that higher spiritual being. And this entire sequence is meant to establish the relationship between these characters and that higher spiritual being. So in the service of that, if you had to describe this as either being a predominantly light picture or a predominantly dark picture, is this light or dark? Light. It's light, right? And where is the majority of that light? Is it on the top or the bottom of the picture? The top. The top, right? And what about here? Where's the majority of the light here? Top or bottom? Top. And what about here? Top. It's coming okay. from the sky. It's coming from the sky. Now, this is where a little bit of familiarity with the Christian story area and a little bit of history does help. In the Middle Ages, light was effectively synonymous with the representation of God, hence Gothic cathedrals and all their stained glass windows, etc. So when you had light streaming into a Gothic cathedral that was reaching up as high as possible to get as close to God as possible, you had the physical manifestation of light aka god coming in right to that space as well now again it doesn't matter whether or not you buy this particular story or otherwise what you have are three different scenes that are set up that consistently represent that particular lightness as a way of contrasting it with the darkness that's below that's more associated with people and as we go forward as we cut from this to this is this a predominantly dark or light picture? Dark. 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 All right. Now, where is your horizon line here? Is it the eye line of the uh, nun? Like, is it down low? It's the eye line of the nun. And here, it's the eye line of the nun. And here, it's the eye line of the nun. Where is your horizon line here? Chickens. Chickens. All right. So. Now, is the horizon line lower, right, in terms of its relationship to the floor here or in any one of these three scenes? The lower or higher? Are, they're the lowest. They're the lowest. All right, so now the question that I will ask you is why would you make this choice to change from essentially, let's call it a six foot or a five foot horizon line to a one foot horizon line, but also go from a predominantly light picture to a predominantly dark picture. What's the point in doing that? It makes it more dramatic as far as storytelling. It, it definitely makes it more dramatic, that abrupt shift in contrast levels. Okay. But 
what's the purpose of making that more dramatic? Is it just drama for drama's sake or is there a point being made? Maybe they're trying to differentiate House of God with every other place. Exactly. You're trying to disassociate, you're trying to accentuate the separation between where that spiritual being lives in the sky versus where every other animal, including us, lives. So there's a direct association that's being made between the nuns, the chickens, the audience, right? And everything else that's terrestrially bound that's essentially plunged into darkness, right? Comparatively, because look what they immediately cut to as well. Predominantly light or dark picture? Light. Light. And where's your horizon line now, more importantly? Like the first world top of the windows. Almost. Look at where these, look at where these lines are pointing. Like the bottom of the building. Where the people are standing. Where the people are standing. So now your eye line, look at what's been done. Your eye line has been made you or has made you associate with the nuns here, the chickens here, and now back to the nuns, but now the nuns are way down here. Right, again, and look at how small they are in relationship to what? The building. The building. The building. And what's the building essentially a representation of? The uh, house of God. So. so everything in this sequence is designed to make you identify with this character, with these characters in association to this, and then stage a more complicated relationship right between those characters, animals, right? And that other deity, and then reinforce that by making those characters feel even smaller in relationship to that big, but also bright environment. And then look what happens when we get here. What kind of perspective do we shift into here? Oh. Is it bird's eye? Also known as? God's eye. God's eye view. <laughs> right? right? Where now you have a radically different perspective looking down on that character's or on that deity's servants. High contrast pointing out the focal point of his kid who's looking back up at dad. Right? There's no reason to have this right, really dark right, and in that position. There's also no reason to have this character wearing a black glove that gets closer to that area or have this in high contrast closer to that area okay. this now allows you to take on the perspective of who these people are in the service of before you go back to a similar type of shot where's your eye line now center no nope. no bottom left bottom left down over here with these characters where's your eye line now Ooh, look at this bottom right bottom right right and you see how these characters are consistently pushed down in the frame the frame is a consistently made to be really really bright and that brightness associated with the upper sections of the frame with the radical exception of this scene here so this is a really nice example of storytelling right metaphorically symbolically right etc right but also just um cinematically, right, in terms of controlling the visual tools that we have at our disposal in order to tell a particular story. Knowing how chickens symbolically relate to the Christian story, knowing how light relates to the Christian story, all of this is useful stuff, but it's not useful in the sense that the story is entirely unintelligible, right, without, right, without knowing those things, right. And this is where image interpretation or story interpretation becomes important, right, and as an easy way of kind of like leaning into that for what might potentially be the first time, start with what it is that you're looking at. And the value of image interpretation is that when you look at what other people are doing and how they're doing it, is that it essentially provides you information for how to do stuff of your own, right? Those choices were made, they did these particular things, all right, I wanna do similar things, right? So you kind of like grab from everywhere that you've been exposed to and pour it into your own picture. Right, when it's most appropriate. Okay, so um, radically different movie, but uh, just as good. If it wasn't for uh, Mia Kunis being involved in it, it would be a really good movie. Instead, it's just got 
you know, 15, 20 minute chunk of it that I could do without. Oops. Forget always the order in which I need to do things. Okay, so Book of Eli. This is actually a very, it's a very beautiful movie. And for the most part, it is actually, it's a very good movie worth watching, especially if you like, uh, what's his name? Gary Oldman and uh, Denzel Washington. It's great. Um, anyway, let's say that you had to interpret this picture. This picture does everything that your assignment should do. There's your focal point. High contrast, directly in front of a one point vanishing point, empty breathing space in, or in and around it isolated as a result of it. All lights and lines, so to speak, point towards you identifying this as being the thing that's most important in the picture. It also has a realistic sense of depth. High detail, dark stuff up in front, lighter stuff, low detail as you get further off into the background. Now, in terms of the emotion, what is the emotion that's being created here? If you had to describe it in one, one word, and there's not one right answer to this, it can have a multiplicity. Multivariance is the fancy word of saying this. What are some of the ways that you might describe this if you had to use one word to describe it? Quite lonely. Tense. Tense, Hopeless. okay. Hopeless, okay. Isolated. Isolated. Okay. Is this, what about like if we ask the questions about the character? Is like, is this character powerful or not powerful? Powerful. Mm -hmm. Important or not important? important? Important. Mysterious or not mysterious? Mysterious. Mysterious. Okay, so all of these things are embedded right, in the emotional interpretation of this picture. Now, the importance of this is look at how that changes if we just do something simple like this. Say that that's your picture now where you change the framing around that character, you change the amount of space that that character has around them. How does that, nothing changes in terms of the depth, nothing changes in terms of the focal point, but everything changes in terms of the emotion. What might you interpret this now or characterize this now emotionally? He's Pro under pressure. He's under pressure. Why is he under pressure? Because all the area around him is putting pressure on him. Okay, so that space even though he's got breathing space around him there's a lot less of it so he's now much more claustrophobic okay now what's creating that claustrophobia what's the object look like a jail cell like a cage jail cell or a cage so i'm assuming that you guys have seen this clip right so what is this character walking into uh, a trap it's walking into a trap so this is a really lovely way of foreshadowing that just by using this object as a way of creating that visual foreshadowing for that. Because it keep in mind, it's like, this could be anything, right? There's no reason that this couldn't be a garbage bag, right? Or another piece of just random apocalyptic furniture that's laying around. Right? And look what happens like as we move forward, how things change. Look at what now has been incorporated into that trap and incorporated into that frame. Right? This figure now becomes part of that cage. But also, as this figure steps forward, look at how this character changes from a high contrast situation of black versus white. And as it crosses through this person, now changes into a lower contrast situation of light versus black. Right? So that removes... So this, does this character feel more or less powerful now? Less powerful more or less mysterious less mysterious right and now when the pan finally stops if you were to think about this two-dimensional this will be important in a couple of classes look at what this character has to get past in order to keep moving forward in his story darkness and shadow oh, darkness and shadow but represented by this character here. So when we cut to this scene here, what's your focal point in this scene? 
The lady on the ground. Okay, now, better question. Why is the lady on the ground the focal point? Because she contrasts to the background. She does, right? But is there and anything is else? Isolated. Is there is there anything else in the background that, or anything else in that environment that contrasts to an equal amount? The container does, but I think mostly it's because the last scene was showing her like taking half the screen, and now you see that like she's just a small part. Okay, so what are other ways of creating focus? Isolation. Isolation, right? But the containers are isolated too. What's another way of creating or creating focus? Oh, it was the size, right? No. No. Because we can't see like any features on her. No. Is that, that might add to uh, it. Like, is that is it because there's two containers, so like you kind of they cancel each other out? Sorry, what was that? Because there's two containers, so they cancel each other out. They kind of cancel each other out. So she, with respect to them, is what? Different. Unique. 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 Right. So she's the oh. only other person in the environment. There's just a bunch of other garbage and shit. So what you have is an environment that creates multiple points of focus, but a primary point of focus in a in a particular way. Right, because it's the moving talking part, right, and a unique part. But now the question remains, why would you have these other two elements creating focus for this character to be distracted by in this environment? What's the point of doing that? Maybe a sense of danger. Okay, so everything in this environment is now important to that character. So when we scroll forward, Right, and these guys pop out from behind that thing. Everything in that environment is important to this character. Everything in that environment we've been made to pay attention to, right, is potentially dangerous, right, because of its high contrast situation. So it's meant to be distracted in order to, again, foreshadow the fact that this is going to happen. So that was really nicely controlled in terms of foreshadowing that trap raising the tension of the possibility of that trap, springing that trap, right? And now making that trap a lot more obvious in terms of what it actually is constituted by, by all of these people, right? But then also putting them in a really high contrast all along with the tunnel in order to make this character feel like they're compressed again inside of a cage of a different, a different sort. Now, when we move forward in this, they do a really nice thing with these two characters. This character is in high contrast with a light background. This character is in high contrast with a dark background. Right? This is a really nice way of saying that these two characters are both important, but they're on opposite sides of the spectrum. Right? Same thing as variety versus repetition. Right? One kind of same kinds of contrast, but at different ends of the spectrum. Right? So that we know that these two characters aren't going to get along with each other. Also what they do here. Who has the highest degree of contrast in this picture? The Denzel character or the other character? The other character. The other character. Now, if you, can, if you, if you interpreted levels of contrast as being synonymous with levels of power inside a picture, who has more power in this picture? The other character. The other character. So they've done a really nice job in terms of reducing this character's contrast by putting him in front of this thing to make this character less important, accentuate this character's importance. And they do this consistently. So this is a really nice touch here. Look at how they step the Denzel character back into a low contrast situation to effectively remove any sort of power that that character has and accentuate all of these characters here. But even nicer than that is what they do a little bit further on.
what have they done with these two characters now? We've like isolated them. Yeah, and do, and who has a greater degree of contrast? Do either of them have a greater degree of contrast? No, they put them on the same level by putting them in the lower contrast. They put them at the same level, right? So effectively, that means that these characters are now equal, right, with each other. So what's going to happen between these two characters? Conflict or no conflict? Conflict. Conflict. Who's going to win? If you hadn't seen this clip before, would there be any visual cues as to who's going to win between these two characters? No. No, not really. Not in this. Not really. Still. Right. So this is a nice way of equalizing those characters. Now, who still has the upper hand and why? Uh, the other character, because he has his henchmen. The other character, because he has all these guys that are effectively an extension of this character's power and they're all in high contrast. Right, so even though these characters have been equalized really nicely, these characters, right, still act as a pervasive threat. So this is a really nice sequence here. It goes from immediately from this, where these characters are both shown in upshot, to the Denzel character being thrown directly into the middle of the frame in high contrast, right, to accentuate that character's resurgence of power. Right? And then this whole sequence here, all this is is the Skyfall. Right, the Skyfall skyscraper fight all over again. Everything's in profile, nicely choreographed, so you can see everything clearly with really limited information, made to feel a little bit more dramatic because of an upshot, et cetera. All the standard tools. Everything that they've done up until this point has really been quite interesting, and this is just the formula executed really well. This is my favorite part, right, of this whole sequence. What's the focal point of this, po of this picture? The guy on top? Nope. Hand. The hand. His severed hand laying in the middle of the road. And then Denzel, like the cold son of a bitch that he is, comes over and kicks it out of the way. Fucking Denzel. Do I want to watch you kill people with a fucking nail gun in aisle six at Home Depot? You're goddamn right I do. Okay, so um, I highly recommend watching this movie. Try to ignore the Maya Kunis, or Mia Kunis parts, right? But it's an excellent movie because it's effectively in a monochromatic palette, which is really good for what we're doing and what we will be doing over the next um, four or five classes. So it's a nice, um, it's a nice thing to start to develop some visual vocabulary with there. The Ida one, I recommend watching that as well, but just be aware that it's not exactly a page turner. Um, it's a short movie. It is, it is foreign, so it's dubbed from the original Polish. Um, but it is excellent. And um, for those of you who are interested in visual control and cinematography, um, it's an excellent resource to have in your back pocket. Um, speaking of back pocket, um, not at all, actually. Uh, those are all the words that need to be said by me today. Uh, <sighs> so do you guys have any questions for me? other than individual questions about assignments, et cetera. <laughs>